and then oh and uh, we'll we'll be uh at the very end um uh, if you can just save your questions to the very end we'll answer questions at the end and you can use the chat feature on zoom and um and i'll be able to go through the questions to your questions that way all right uh, so let's start out with the basics. So what are the coronary arteries? So I'm assuming everybody kind of knows what arteries are. They're the kind of muscular tubes that uh, put blood flow out to the organs and tissues. And the coronary arteries specifically are just the um, arteries that are specific to providing blood flow and oxygen nutrients to the heart muscle. And um, we have three main arteries. Um, you have two arteries that come off uh, the aorta, which is the big pipe that comes up the pumping chamber of the heart, the left ventricle. And then those two arteries, one on the right side, uh, numbered one there is the right coronary artery. And then uh, you have a left main coronary that splits into two other arteries. Uh, one is the left circumflex, and the other one is the left anterior descending artery, uh, the LAD artery that comes down the front of the heart muscle. So what is coronary artery uh, disease? So as you can imagine, it's disease of the coronary arteries. So Build up of blockages, and you'll hear me allude to plumbing a lot. So it's kind of like a pipe. It's a uh, it's got a central open area. It's a muscular uh, tube that provides the blood flow. And so when you start developing blockages in this tube, as you might in plumbing at home, um, you limit the blood flow and limit the ability for the heart muscle to get um, oxygen and nutrients. So you get this development of um, these deposits uh, you, called plaques. You may have heard that term before. <laughs> Um, so but it starts in our teenage years, you can develop fatty streaks along the inside wall, along those cells over time. Um, they develop, um, you know, inflammatory cells, cholesterol gets deposited there. They can become calcified, protein, cellular waste, fibrin, all these things, fibrous materials um, in, a, in a process known as atherosclerosis. Uh, it's kind of a big medical term, but you might see that term come up or not. It really just is the development of these heart blockages in the coronary arteries. So how do we develop them? What are the risk factors for CAD, coronary disease? So I break these down into two um, areas. One is non-modifiable, things that we don't really have control over, things we can't change. And then modifiable, things that we do have some control over. So the non-modifiable things are your age, you're gonna to continue to age. We don't have a, a magic, uh, anything that can make you younger, uh, biologic gender, um, your genetics, your family history, you kind of dealt the genetic uh, hand you're dealt. Um, and then the, the other uh, risk factors, the ones that we do have some control over are these modifiable risk factors. So that includes blood pressure, high blood pressure, a term called hypertension is a risk factor for heart disease, cholesterol, high cholesterol, um, you might hear the term lipids. Um, another one is diabetes is a common uh, significant risk factor for heart disease, and then smoking. And then I also include uh, diet exercise here because it also uh, diet and exercise, having living a sedentary lifestyle, not eating well, those are all risk factors, but they also kind of work very closely to the blood pressure because lack of exercise and poor diet um, are all uh, cause hypertension, high cholesterol, and diabetes. All right, so uh, those are the risk factors for uh, coronary disease, also risk factors of heart attack. So what specifically is a heart attack and how is it different than just coronary artery disease? So um, to have a heart attack, you usually do have some level of coronary artery disease, so some level of blockages in these blood vessels. And what happens in a heart attack is that that plaque, that blockage, has maybe a soft core and a fibrous kind of rougher coating, um, tougher coating on the top, where that, that plaque can rupture, okay? And that, that plaque rupture causes the activation of your own body's clotting system. And so you get platelets, you get clotting proteins and you form a clot. So that maybe that 70% blockage you had in your artery that was still letting some blood flow go to the heart muscle, it might get 100% blocked and limit blood flow completely to that area. Here's a little, uh, another cartoon um, that kind of explains it looking down the barrel of a heart artery. So you can look at it um, as if you have this plaque here and then you can see kind of if it ruptures and that gets exposed and that's what activates these platelets and can and make that uh, blockage form. Okay, so let's, so uh, as another example, that picture of the heart muscle we had. So say you have that plaque and that blockage form right there, that's the front of the LED near the top of the artery right in the uh, first part of it. Um, well, everything beyond that now all of a sudden is not getting blood flow. It's not that heart muscle is not getting oxygen. It's not getting nutrients. So that heart muscle and those cells start to die and that can decrease your heart function that can lead to deadly heart rhythm abnormalities. And so that that's why a heart attack can be deadly. Okay. So how do you know if you have heart disease or coronary disease? So common symptoms, 
chest pain, substernal pain, the classic elephant sitting on the chest. Um, not everybody describes it as pain. Some people say, well, it's not a pain. It's just a discomfort or a pressure of fullness. Um, you can have that uh, pain and tingling. It could uh, what we call radiate or refer. So you might have pain here that comes up to the neck or goes to the shoulders or to the arm um, or back. Um, you might have trouble breathing. And the other important thing to note about these symptoms is they're usually worse with exertion. So um, as you can imagine, uh, or uh, if your heart muscle is sitting there at rest, it doesn't need a lot of blood flow. But if you start exerting yourself, walking up a flight of stairs, exercising, well, your leg muscles and everything want more oxygen. They're working harder. So they're telling your heart, hey, we want more blood flow. Send us more uh, uh, blood flow, more oxygen. So that increases your cardiac output. Well, then the heart muscle starts working harder. It wants more blood flow. And so when you have these blockages and say 70% blockage in there that might've allowed adequate blood flow to a resting heart muscle, but when it starts working harder and wants more, that might not be able to, to, to deliver as much oxygen as it wants. And then that's when you get symptoms. So you might have exertional symptoms. And so then when you stop and take a break, those symptoms get better. That's real classic for heart disease. So how is a heart attack different than that? Well, it's more or less the same. I mean, you have a lot of the same symptoms as you do with coronary disease, um, stable coronary disease. That's not causing you to have a heart attack at the moment. Um, but what could be different about a heart attack is that all this, it happens all of a sudden. It happens while you're rest, maybe not when you're exerting yourself. The symptoms don't go away when you stop and take a break. You might have some associated symptoms, some nausea, vomiting. Burping. Um, you might get very sweaty, and uh, another term for that is diaphoretic. That's a medical term. So, a lot of sweating, cold, clammy, uh, have palpitations, or a racing heart, or uneven heartbeat. Um, you might feel dizzy, lightheaded, like you're going to pass out. And that's not to say that every time somebody feels lightheaded or dizzy, it means they're having a heart attack. It's not like an exclusive symptom, but it just means that of the constellation of things that can happen to someone or what they can feel when they're having a heart attack, that this is a list of things that commonly uh, occur. All right, so how do we, how do we find out um, whether you have it or not? You may have symptoms, you may not have symptoms. Well, the gold standard, um, the way to definitively tell whether or not you have these heart blockages is something known as a cardiac catheterization. And we'll go into detail a little bit later about what a cardiac catheterization is. Um, but basically it's a procedure that's an invasive procedure that you're going in and physically looking at the heart arteries, these tubes, this plumbing, um, and saying whether or not you can see a blockage there. The problem is these, the procedure is invasive. It, it's, uh, it, it's not without risk. So, you know, we don't want to take everybody that walks into our office and say, well, let's just find out if you have heart disease. Let's just do an invasive procedure because with it not being zero risk, when you take, you know, a thousand people, all, all of a sudden you're going to have some people that have complications. So you really only want to take people that you think you're going to find something with. So what other tests can we do to evaluate whether or not somebody has heart disease? So one of the most common tests we do is something known as an EKG, ECG, electrical cardiogram. Um, people, most people are pretty familiar with this kind of, um, you know, this little ditzel. Um, and so it's basically, if you think about it, it the heart is a pump. It has, a, it has an electrical system that needs to activate that heart so it knows when to beat. Um, so this electrical system starts at the top of the heart, travels all the way down, lets the top chambers, the atrium beat, and then travels down to the atrioventricular node through the AV, atrioventricular node goes and beats the bottom chambers of the heart. So what we're doing is we're looking at this 3D pattern in a 2D fashion. Um, along the x-axis, you have time. So moving along time, we see, we know what that normal electrical pattern is and they call it a 12 lead AKG. So you see all these different numbers um, and they mean that we're looking at this 3D muscle in, in multiple vectors, multiple 2D planes, if you will. And we know what the normal pattern should look like. Okay, so this is a normal EKG, but say somebody had heart disease. Well, you might see some changes. So if you look here, um, not to get too much in the weeds on this, but there's some changes after the big, uh, we call the QRS, so the big spike, there's some, uh, the line kind of goes down, depresses a bit. So that might be consistent with someone that has a heart blockage or is having a heart attack. Well, we can also, outside just the electrical pattern, we can also do something called an echocardiogram. This is an ultrasound of the heart. Um, this uh, is basically being able to physically look at the heart muscle. Uh, we get really good pictures. And again, it's a 3D structure that we're trying to look at in a 2D fashion. So we know we have these set um, kind of images that we know to look at. We know that this chamber is the right ventricle. This chamber is the left ventricle. This is where the valve is. This is what this is doing. And um, this is another example. We can get a look um, at all four chambers. So the R is the right, L is the left, and then the V is for the ventricle and the A is for the atrium. So those are all four chambers. And this is just a, um, a still image. But um, when we're looking at these ultrasounds, the heart's moving. It's a live moving heart image. And we can take a look at the heart muscle, make sure it's squeezing. Somebody that might have heart blockages, 
this heart muscle might already be dead or damaged. It might not be squeezing as well. A certain portion of it might not be working. That might clue us in that we're concerned that there might be coronary artery disease. All right, so the, the EKG stress, um, echo, and then the other thing we can do, um, people are kind of familiar with this known as stress test. Well, we have more than one stress test. The most common one people kind of think of is the treadmill stress test. This is the one where you'll have electrodes strapped to your chest and um, you're gonna be on a treadmill and you're gonna start, they're gonna start exercising, you're gonna walk faster, walk uphill. And what they're looking at is they're trying to exert your heart muscle. So the same way I described those 70% blockages might not be a big deal at rest. Well, when all of a sudden we exert you, we might all of a sudden start having part of the heart muscle that's not getting enough blood flow. And um, we're going to all of a sudden see, uh, well, maybe the EKG is changing a bit. So like, we'll see maybe when you're at rest, you have a normal EKG like this, but then when you start exercising and um, moving faster, you might start developing changes like this. So this would be a positive stress test. Okay, because you're having EKG uh, changes that are consistent with heart blockages while you exert yourself. Well, another thing we can do is we can add we can add images to this. So we can do the, we can do a stress echocardiogram. So you're doing the treadmill EKG, but then on top of that, we look at your heart muscle and see how it's moving while you've exerted yourself. So maybe the heart muscle is working well at rest, but then all of a sudden we've exercised you, your heart's working faster, it wants more oxygen. Part of that heart muscle is not getting that oxygen because of a heart blockage. And so all of a sudden we can see, well, then while this side's moving, this side's not moving as much. And that would clue somebody in that you might have heart disease. Um, another stress test we do, which is a, more, probably one of the most common stress tests we order is a nuclear stress test, a little bit more complicated to explain with the physiology and everything, but it provides us a little bit more, you still get stress, but we provide us with a little bit more information. Basically, the, the red cells are tagged with the nuclear radioisotope, and we can actually see parts of the heart muscle that get blood flow. And these are emitting photons to our detector, our imager. And we can say, well, look how this lights up. This part of the heart muscle is getting good blood flow. But when we stress the person, well, this part of the heart muscle doesn't get lit up as much. So this one's not getting as much blood flow. I'm concerned there might be a heart blockage there. And then in addition to the stress tests, there's some non-stress imaging tests we can do that take a look and see whether or not you have um, heart blockages. So some people might be familiar with the calcium score. So if you remember earlier, I was saying that, well, what makes up these heart blockages? Well, calcium is a big part of it. And so if, we're, if we have um, a CT scan that measures um, the amount of calcium is there, you might say, well, if you have a higher amount of calcium, there's a higher risk of how much heart disease you may have. Another thing is known as a CT angiogram. So this is um, a CT, and basically instead of uh, an invasive cardiac catheterization where we physically inject the dye in the heart artery, we put the dye in through the IV and we gate it so that when the dye gets to the heart, that's when we start taking our CT images. And then the computers are able to kind of formulate these images. And so what you're looking at here is in this picture, and I don't expect everyone to exactly know and be able to read CTs, but this lighter area here, um, as opposed to the darker, the lighter area is the area where the contrast is going. So that's the, that's the pipe, so they, the coronary artery. So if you see where the yellow arrow is pointing, it's kind of a smooth um, kind of uh, looking uh, light area. And then it gets that bright white spot, which would be concerning for calcium and potentially a blockage. <clears throat> Here are some other pictures from a CT. So this light part in the middle here is the big empty part of the pumping chamber of the heart. The aorta is the white part here on the left, the light gray part. And that string of gray across the top, um, that's the heart artery that's been reformatted uh, through the CT. And see how it kind of disappears where that white arrow is? That would be an area where maybe the dye is not able to get through. That would be concerning for a blockage. And then they can also do these three re 3D reconstructions, very cool stuff they can do um, with our CT angiograms. So what happens if the test is abnormal? Well, then once you have an abnormal test, well, now we think the benefits, now that we have more evidence that says, well, hey, maybe we're going to find something, we think the benefits outweigh the risks. And we think, hey, maybe you should go ahead and have that invasive heart catheterization. Um, and then the, the other, sorry, so a lot of this was potentially uh, outpatient. So you might get a stress test when you see a doctor in the office. Well, what happens if you end up in the hospital and they're thinking you have a heart attack? Well, they're going to do a lot of the same stuff, the EKG, the echo. They're going to look at your clinical symptoms. So do you have chest pain when you exert yourself? Does it get better with rest? They're going to see how, how much your story sounds like it might be coming from heart blockages. They're going to look at that EKG, see if you have those changes, like I mentioned. One thing different they might do in the hospital that you might not get done in the doctor's office is get a lab test called um, a troponin. This is a term that may come up. Uh, it's, uh, it might be worth being familiar with the term. What a troponin is, is basically it's a protein. It, it's um, 
commonly found in the heart muscle cells. And if you have heart damage, like in a heart attack, um, this protein leaks into the blood and we're able to test that with blood tests. And so if you come in with a good story, an abnormal EKG and, an, and a positive troponin in your lab tests, well, your doctor's probably not gonna order a stress test. He might say, hey, we have enough evidence that we think proceeding with catheterization makes sense. So uh, the benefits outweigh the risks, we're gonna go straight to catheterization. So what is a catheterization? So we've kind of been alluding to it a little bit, taking direct pictures of um, the heart arteries. So if you ever have to have one, um, uh, this is, I'll explain a little bit now. Um, so it could be an outpatient or an inpatient uh, procedure. Um, the, um, uh, the one other misconception uh, normally people have is they think that they're going to be put to sleep completely. We don't commonly use general anesthesia. So I've been talking about risk a lot. Every, and we, what we're doing is constantly trying to minimize risk. And so when we do put somebody completely to sleep, use an anesthesiologist, but use general anesthesia, we're increasing incrementally the risk of the procedure. So most people get what we call conscious sedation. You will get some medicine that makes you comfortable, um, usually a narcotic called fentanyl that helps uh, is a pain medicine. And then um, another medicine called Versed, which is basically a medicine that um, works similar to the receptors that if you, you have a cocktail or drink some alcohol, uh, works on. So it should, make you, it should make you more sedated, more relaxed. Um, oftentimes people do fall asleep, but we're, we're really just trying to give enough not medicine sure. to make you comfortable, uh, but not enough to increase the risk or make it down. So if you need a heart catheterization, um, there's two routes that are commonly used. One is the femoral, that's the down in the groin, the, the, those arteries, or uh, more commonly nowadays, we're using the radial artery, which is the artery right here on the wrist. Um, you should have one in both. Um, and again, we're using the plumbing, we're using the natural arteries that uh, we have and using them to travel to get to the heart to take a look at those heart arteries. Um, and so... Uh, like I said, we could use either radio is usually our, our first choice. You can imagine one of the risks of this procedure is bleeding. If um, you bleed in the arm, there's not a whole lot of space for blood to go. But if we have an issue down in the leg and you have a bleeding down there, a bleeding issue down there, there's a lot more space for blood to go. It can be a lot more traumatic. So again, we always try radio first. And if we can't do that, we go uh, the femoral approach. So um, when you get this done, if you ever need to have it done, what's going to happen is you're, like I said, you're going to be brought into the cath lab. You'll be sterilely draped. You'll get some sedation medicine, some sleepy medicine. And what your cardiologist is going to do is he's going to access your artery. He's going to get into your artery. And the way he's going to do that is with, first, what he'll do is use a needle. Uh, he'll numb up the skin with lidocaine. So you get some topical anesthetic there, um, local anesthetic. And then with the needle enters uh, the artery and you get some blood flow back, he'll put a wire in. And it's, so it's in the, what we call the lumen, the inside the tube of the artery. Over that wire, what he's going to do is he's going to be put something called a sheath, or it's basically like a big IV, but it's not in the vein, it's an artery. That's this thing on the lower right here, this green and white thing. Basically, what that is is a night, it's a it's kind of a straw, it's a big tube that has a one-way valve on it. So we can put things in, but you're not going to be bleeding out from it. And what this, what this allows us to do is move these catheters, these plastic tubes, and navigate them all the way to the heart. So on the left here, that's if we use the femoral approach to go all the way down up the aorta and around the aortic arch. And you'll see on the right side here, these two pictures. And this little straw catheter fits nicely. They're designed uh, based on normal anatomy to fit nicely into the, the origin of that heart artery so we can take our pictures. So A here is if you're going from the leg. And then B, you'll see uh, the catheter comes from the top. That's if it's coming from the arm. It'll come down up the subclavian artery, break cephalic artery come down and uh, be able and we'll be able to navigate it into this heart artery so we can take our pictures so this is what those these are the angiogram this is what a heart catheterization these are the pictures that we're taking okay this is um uh normal arteries and so uh number just like the cartoon i showed you earlier you have the left circumflex the lad the rca the three um or main arteries and what we're doing is it's like plumbing it's like pipes you want to see nice smooth pipes and so the little curve on the very top left of that picture is the catheter that's where they inject the dye that's we can see under the x-ray so it's not a video camera we're in putting on into your artery we're injecting a dye that shows up under x-ray OK, we can't see your arteries without the dye. They don't show up under x-ray. So by putting the dye in it, filling the tube, filling the pipe with this dye, we can see the if there's any blockages. OK, so these are nice, smooth pipes. These are normal arteries. You see the branches. They taper down nicely um, and go into the capillary. So what happens? What does it look like if you have a blockage? So here's what it looks like. So you have a nice smooth pipe. See how it kind of disappears or kind of like an apple core. It's because the dye can't go through that heart blockage. OK, and so that is, you know, a tight 99 percent blockage there in that LED. And um, your doctor is probably going to get this picture done and say, well, we need to fix that. So what, what's he going to do? 
So the first thing he does is he's, while he's fixing this, is he's going to put a little wire through that catheter, through that straw tube he has through your arm. And that wire is going to go all the way down to your heart. And he's going to, he's going to feed that into your heart artery and across the blockage. Okay. Then what he's going to do over that wire, he's going to steer a balloon. He's going to steer a little balloon. And this is, you know, this is very small. It's two, three millimeters big. And he's going to be able to put it right where your blockage is. And then he's going to inflate it. Okay. And that's going to help open up that blockage from 99 and make it a lot less. And see, now we have a nice open artery there. We have improved blood flow. The problem is you can't just stop there because we found that when you balloon it only, well, that blockage might come back very quickly in three to six months. So we're going to want to put a stent there. And that stent's going to help keep that artery open for a longer period of time. So the same idea, he's going to take a balloon down there, but this balloon has a stent, a metal cage scaffold uh, crimped around it. So when he inflates it, that metal cage is going to sit inside that artery and help keep that artery open. Here's a little cartoon graphic that kind of explains what I'm saying. So you have a little balloon over a wire. It has a little metal cage called a stent around it. He inflates the balloon. Uh, he or she inflates the balloon. And then now your stent is in the artery. Um, so as an example, a cartoon there. So you now have a stent there. And people have asked me, well, when does the stent come out? Well, it doesn't come out. Once you have a stent, you have a stent. It's going to stay there. And the hope is that those blockages don't develop back soon. And, and with the new drug loading stents, and if it's done well, we hope, and you're on the right medicines and controlling your risk factors, we hope that blockage does not come back. Well, what happens if you don't have only one blockage? What if you have multiple blockages? So here's an example of some heart arteries that have multiple blockages in different areas. Well, there's a, there's a couple of things you can do. So one, um, you might have so many blockages that you need bypass surgery. So triple bypass, quadruple bypass terms you may have heard before, and we'll go over that in a second. Or you might get uh, multiple stents. So what we call multi-vessel, multiple, multi being multiple vessel, those arteries, and then PCI, percutaneous coronary intervention, which is really just the fancy word for stents. Okay, and they might do it all at once, putting three stents in once, or he might, he or she might put in a stent once and then come back later at another day and put the stents in the other arteries. And split up the procedures, if you will. Well, what happens if you have a blockage like this? This is a blockage that's a pretty severe blockage really early on, and it's kind of right at, a, at a, what we call a trifurcation, so right where the artery splits into three. So a blockage like this might not be easily fixable. If you have, where, where would you put the wire? You know, you might not even be able to go with the wire across that. And as you can imagine, the stent is just a singular tube. So which, which one of these tubes do you put it in? And if you put the artery and blow it up, does it close off the other arteries? And so in a situation like this, you might not have a good option for anything. You might have to get bypass surgery. All right, so to explain bypass surgery, I kind of made this graphic little cartoon, so bear with me with my little PowerPoint cartoon. So imagine this is a, um, a little bucket of water. That's our pipe, um, so plumbing analogy again, uh, and we have good blood flow or water flow going through there. Well, all of a sudden, you have a blockage. Well, the blockage in that pipe is preventing that flow from getting around. So what a bypass does if you need bypass surgery is this, and it's not the interventional cardiologist that's going to be doing this. This is the cardiac surgeon uh, that's going to be doing this. They'll come in put a new hole in a new, a new pipe, a new graft. So it'll either be a vein from your leg or a different artery that they'll harvest. And they'll go and say, okay, you got a blockage here. Well, we'll put this back up to our, our bucket of water, our blood flow. And we're just going to connect it in just distal, just after the blockage. So we can improve the blo the blood flow past that blockage. And so that blockage is insignificant. Now we have, we have bypassed it and you get good flow there. And so this is the same idea here. Um, so single, double, single, double, triple, what that means is just the number of bypasses they need, the number of um, uh, vessels they have to put in and blocks they have to supersede. So, um, and so you can kind of correlate it. If you need a quadruple bypass, you probably had a whole lot more blockages uh, in your heart arteries than someone that only had a single. And just to use the same analogy from, to explain with our stent. So same idea, wire balloon with the stent and we'd inflate the stent just directly in the artery and improve our blood flow that way. Okay, so um, after stenting, so say you get a stent, um, you might go home that same day, or you might stay overnight for the next day, it just kind of depends what, what, uh, what the procedure was like, or uh, your doctor's kind of preference. And then very important, after you have the stent, um, you need, you'll need to be on medication to help prevent that stent from clotting. Um, these are called antiplatelet medicines. Sometimes people nickname them kind of blood thinners. They don't really thin the blood, but what they do is they make it. So if you remember from back earlier, we were talking about what a heart attack is, that clot forms, right? The plaque ruptures and the clot forms and the artery gets clogged. But when you have this metal cage, it's foreign to the body too. And so the platelets, the same way if you cut yourself and form a, a clot and a scab, well, these platelets, they want to come in and form a clot on this foreign stent that they're seeing. So you're going to be taking medicines like aspirin. They're going to prevent those platelets from causing that clot. And then some stronger medicines like aspirin, but they're stronger, called Plavix, Berlinta, or Effian. 
you'll be on those for at least a year, aspirin probably for the rest of your life. And, and that's going to help prevent heart attacks, help prevent that stent from closing down. All right, so I've been alluding to risk. So these heart procedures, this cardiac catheterization is not risk-free. You know, there's risk of death, stroke, bleeding, heart attack. Um, the contrast dye we use to see um, the arteries under the x-ray is um, toxic to the kidneys, so the kidneys might not like it. And um, as you can see, this, this is one article that I... Um, graphic from one study that showed, you know, one in 10,000 risk of death, um, less than one in 10,000 risk of heart attack during the procedure. So they're very, very, very small risks. And the way I kind of equate this to people to kind of put it, because it can sound very scary when you explain this procedure and say, well, you could die, you could have a stroke, you could bleed. Um, even though they're very small risks, it sounds very scary. But if you think about it, Every time you get in a car and drive somewhere, it's not a 0% risk of motor vehicle accident. Yet we get behind the wheel of a car and drive everywhere all the time without thinking twice. And, um, you know, but it's not risk-free either. And so just to put it in perspective, I found this data from the National Safety Council. And it's a little, this is lifetime odds. So it's little apples and oranges to compare it to the other statistics. But just to kind of rephrase, so you still, you know, heart disease, number one killer, number one risk of death. Um, that's how important this wow. stuff. And, um you know, there's some other kind of fun, uh, you know, interesting uh, statistics in here. Um, uh, bicyclists, one in 4,000 lifetime risk. Cataclysmic uh, storm is uh, one in 55. I guess that's what um, our colleagues and friends in Texas have had to deal with recently. Um, but you get, my, you get my point. There's a lot of risk in everything we do every day. Um, and so my point is when, you know, you're, if you're recommended to have a cardiac catheterization and they're explaining these risks, yes, it's not risk-free. But what we're doing is we're, we're doing the clinical math. Every, the, your doctor is thinking, well, I don't want to, they're, 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 they want to make sound like his name, outweigh the risks. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to recommend this procedure unless they think you're going to benefit from it. Okay. Um, so uh, what do we do? You have heart disease. Um, so the number one thing um, is to manage the risk factors. Um, so um, the blood pressure, high blood pressure, you want to get good blood pressure control. These, I mean, the things that are modifiable, I mean, obviously we can't make you younger and we can't change your genetics. Um, and so we're going to, we want to manage your hypertension. We want to manage your high cholesterol. We want to treat your diabetes or try to prevent you from getting diabetes. Of course, smoking, I don't know anyone that doesn't know smoking isn't good for them. So we want to do everything we can to help people in trying to quit. Um, and of course, diet and exercise, being active, cardiovascular exercise, and having a heart healthy diet uh, are, are just the staples, the very basis of trying to, of both prevention and treatment after development of heart disease. Um, so ASA, that means aspirin. Um, that's classic. If you have heart disease, you're going to be on aspirin. Um, statin, that's a cholesterol medication. Uh, most people are going to be on cholesterol medication some, unless, as long as they can tolerate it. And then this other word, anti anginals angina is a term for chest, a medical term for chest pain. So we give people anti chest pain medicines. Um, and these are medicines that, um, so if you have these blockages, they are uh, medicines that improve the blood flow um, to the, the heart muscle or decrease the workload. Uh, the, uh, so basically improve, improving supply, decreasing demand to try to prevent people from having symptoms. Okay, well, uh, that's, uh, thanks for coming today and um, hearing all that. Um, uh, if you need any more information or want to talk more specifically about yourself or anything, um, we're always happy. We have a whole uh, dozens of cardiologists here at VCS that are happy to chat more with you guys about this. Um, you can go to our website. Uh, you can call us, set up an appointment. We have locations kind of all through the Richmond area. I myself am here at the Stony Point location, um, which is just, uh, just south of the river, so convenient to both the north and south side. Okay, and uh, without further ado, we will open up uh, to questions. All right, so I'm gonna um, start scanning through here to try and answer a few of these. I think some people started um, asking earlier. Is atherosclerosis reversible? That's a good question. So uh, I think the short answer is probably not. If you have a heart blockage, nothing's really taking that blockage away. I think the best thing to do is prevention. And you, or you could have heart blockages that don't ever lead you to have symptoms or cause heart attacks. So that the way to prevent that is being on aspirin, having the cholesterol controlled, having the blood pressure controlled, all those things. Um, Uh, another question, how much plaque buildup is normal as you age? So I have cast people that are close to 100 years old, and they have pristine looking arteries that I would gladly trade my arteries in for. And uh, it just tells you a little bit about risk factor control and uh, genetics. So I would say there's no normal amount for any age, but as you get older, uh, it's more common. The natural history of coronary disease is that it's more common as you get older. I've, and that being said, I've also uh, seen patients in their 30s that I've sent for bypass surgery. And that's your genetics or your genetics. If you 
smoke, you know, you, inc you increase the, the poorly, uh, poor um, blood pressure management, cholesterol management, poor risk factor management. I mean, it is what it is. You're going to develop these things. Um, let's see. Um, all right, so somebody asked this very more, a little more specific question about PET scan. So a PET scan is a type of nuclear stress test. Um, there's a couple different, there's two different types of stress tests, uh, nuclear stress tests, PET scanning and um, uh, SPECT, but uh, that's a little bit more detailed and kind of outside the range of this talk today. Uh, but it's a, it's a type of nuclear stress test. Um, another question, can heart symptoms also mimic GERD, which is reflux? The answer is absolutely. So. Um, one thing that comes up is that people come and see us, they have chest pain. Well, obviously the scary thing when you have chest pain is that you want to make sure you're not having a heart attack, but you know, there's also an esophagus that runs through your chest. The stomach is there. You have lungs, the muscles, bones. So there are other causes of chest pain. People always often get very scared about the heart attack just because of the implications and the um, potential life-threatening consequences. And so we commonly see people as the first evaluation of chest pain, but then our workup is negative. And then after that's negative, then we start looking at other causes. Um, reflux, you know, there's other constellation of symptoms that might have, it, the pain might be worse after eating um, and that sort of thing. All right, let's see. Uh, question, is there a way to identify a block before invoking a catheterization procedure? The answer is yes. So that CT angiogram I had mentioned, sometimes that's a non-invasive kind of a poor man's cardiac catheterization. You can um, take a look and see, because if that's normal, you feel good, you know? And sometimes the problem with the CT is it's not perfect and you can get artifacts. So you might see some kind of intermediate disease, but that doesn't mean it could be really severe or maybe not so bad. So it's not perfect. Um, all right, keep in. So can aspirin produce antiplatelet properties? Yes, aspirin is a antiplatelet medication to help prevent those platelets from forming clots. Um, let's see here. Um, all right, so someone asked a, a, a kind of broad question. Can, we, can you summarize again? Um, what should we do and not do um, for our heart health? Um, uh, so it's kind of, so preventative medicine is kind of a lot of what I described. Managing the risk factors that I described, I think, is the best thing we can do. Having good blood pressure control, good cholesterol control, um, starting with um, diet and exercise, making sure we're doing cardiovascular exercise, which is exercise, a sustained elevated heart rate for about 20 to 30 minutes, three to five times a week. Um, and like I said, you, you don't have control over some things, your age and your genetics, but the things you do have control over, not smoking and managing some of these um, other medical risk factors, I think is uh, the least we can do to help prevent heart disease. Um, one more, a uh, little bit more specific question, high LPA and high LDL. So uh, that's a little bit more specific for cholesterol. So that's, that's a cholesterol question. Um, and yes, so those are indications of having um, uh, high cholesterol and uh, which is uh, correlated uh, with heart disease. Okay. So there are, there are a couple other very, very specific questions for individuals, which um, I'd rather not uh, I, uh, address in the uh, 